This is my dear friend Beatrice. Hey, okay. nice to meet you. Beatrice is a healer. I do massage, sound therapy, Reiki. This woman is a saint. It's like birds fly out of the sky and land on her shoulder. Aw, it's like Snow White. Can I uh, get another bourbon, hun? Oh, no, Doug, this is Beatrice. She's staying for dinner. Oh. You were hovering. I just figured you were part of the staff. Do I know you? Doug's famous. He's been on the news. I don't know why. I think I know you. Ever dance in Vegas? <laughs> Thank you for having us at your stunning home. I couldn't be more pleased at how smoothly this whole process has gone. Alex, if any of those efforts were illegal, I do not know you, nor was I even here tonight. <laughs> Neither was I. And it's my house. Yeah. I would just like to say to Kathy and Grant, thank you for having me. When I first came to the United States a long time ago... Did you come legally? Yes. Oh, this tenderloin was amazing. So is the fish, so buttery. So, dog, you build hotels. I just own them. I always had inside me the desire to be a healer. Good for you. You're working. You're contributing. We're going to South Africa in a couple of days. It's true what they say. Those animals would basically be gone if it wasn't for the hunting. I don't consider it murder. It's like this original dance of man and beast, the struggle for survival. Are you for real? You killed this animal? Hey. You think it's funny? I think it's sick. You think killing is hard? Try healing. You can break something in two seconds, but it can take forever to fix it. Sounds like you have a pretty tough job. I think that fate brought us together. For what? I don't know. Revenge, maybe? You think that you can hide up here behind these gates and that everything is gonna be all right? The world doesn't need your feelings. It needs jobs, it needs money, it needs what I do. The world doesn't need you. Doug is a great philanthropist. Shut up, Gus. Hi, Chihuahua. <laughs> okay, you're, you're done. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. What were you thinking? My relationship with that guy paid for this house. I kind of feel like I don't even know you. You don't know me. can't possibly end well. Oh. Uh, when this caliber of talent comes out to promote a project, it usually means that it's great and everybody likes it. And it is great. Congratulations, guys, on making a wonderful film. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about this from the beginning. This shot in September, I just found out, and was finished by Sundance in January, which is Unbelievable, it's written by... Shot in August. August. Just a couple of days, September. Exactly. Yeah. My yeah. apologies. Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> written by Mike White, who you've collaborated with a number of times, the wonderful uh, Mike White. What was the impetus for this film? Because obviously there are echoes of what we heard, a lot of the rhetoric that we heard in the, in the campaign over the course of the last year and a half, and now in the administration. We, we, we wanted John Lithgow to run for president, but it didn't quite work. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, no, uh, uh, it was actually uh, uh, the dentist who killed Cecil the lion, if you remember, that I think initially outraged Mike, and he was like, what would happen if I was at a dinner party with, uh, you know, like a horrible person like that that's going to say, I'm going to go kill that rare animal. And then at, at around that time, Donald Trump announced that he was running and said those lovely things about Mexicans. Uh, uh, and I, that definitely enraged us as, as, as well. And I think uh, he wanted to make a plea for compassion and for being less divided and uh, wrote this very heartfelt script that I, uh, we could all really relate to. And it, it, you know, when I got it, honestly, I loved it so much, I was just hoping I wouldn't screw it up too much. That's all. And, and you didn't, thankfully you didn't screw it up. Selma, uh, talk about when you got involved. What were you thinking when you first read the script? It's a completely different kind of performance from you than I think we've ever seen. There's something really human, and I think Miguel and Mike White did a wonderful job of emphasizing emphasizing your eyes. Your eyes do wonderful work in this film in terms well, that of- That was Miguel, are. not Mike White didn't write uh, <laughs> the camera directions. Um, I, I I love I love the script and my character it's it's observing a lot of what's happening and when you read on the script it could have felt like it was passive and um, and of course you cannot feel the tension as much I'm a huge fan of Miguel Arteta and Mike White and when I read it because I, I, I actually have the privilege to know them a bit. I knew what a spectacular film this was gonna be, and it's incredible because the tension 
is so consistent throughout the whole film. It's so much that a lot of the comedy comes from the tension. You know, you laugh out of ner nervousness. And uh, I thought it was such a great opportunity for me to be able to, to play this role. Um, already when M Mike was writing it was with, with me in mind and I, I felt so lucky and, and also I felt very moved because throughout this process I really f felt like they really saw me in the way he directed and in the way he wrote it that they really so inside of me whereas a lot of the parts I play it's people who look but not really see you know and for the first time I, I, I felt that so immediate and it's such a special project for me and I'm so proud of it it's one of the best things I've ever done what was that like on set because so often could you feel that on set because so often the shots are you just analyzing what's happening around you just sort of staring at other actors doing no, what they're by doing. the time you get to a set no analyzing we did analyzing before by the time you get on the set you're the character you're present you're leaving it uh and there was so much internal life in the character that it was for me intense and electrifying and i'm not thinking about Am I talking about, there was so much, there was so much, there's so many layers, it had to be very complex, what was going inside my head. But yes, at some point I thought this is nirvana for the actor, for me, you know, what a character. And I don't think anybody's gonna go see this movie, and maybe when they go and they see my face with no makeup, you know, for so long they're gonna walk out or they're gonna go to sleep. <laughs> And I don't care because this is so amazing, you know, to work with this level of talent in something so intelligent and, and meaningful and spiritual in a way. And I was shocked that, how, that people love it. Even, like, my husband loves action films. He's not much of an art house film goer. And he loved it. And trust me, he does not lie. He, he was like, oh my God, all the time you were away for that? You know, he's brutal. And uh, he, he was so moved. And I can see how this movie touches so many different people. I, I don't think there's only one audience for this film. I think the brilliance of the movie is the ability to touch everybody in a different way. Oh. I'll be quiet now. I gotta say, I, I, uh, I despise the person that walks into this movie and says, "Ugh, she's not wearing makeup. I'm out of here." I, th that person shouldn't be seen any movies. Uh, John, Connie, you guys do a wonderful job of making people who could, on the page, maybe come across as just straight villains in many ways. They could be despicable, and in my opinion, they they kind of are. But you play them as if it's totally normal for them. You know, you don't twist the mustache in their villainy because this is daily life for them. This is their regular lives. What, talk to me about that line and never sort of crossing over to it where it felt like it could be kind of campy in terms of the, the villainous titan of industry that you're playing. Well, it's always great when a writer and a filmmaker uh, portrays a world that we all know about but we never get access to. Uh, we know it's there but we're never inside their world. And uh, somehow or other, Mike knows this world very well. He's from Orange County himself. He kept on saying, I've actually heard people say this phrase, you know. Uh, and he, 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 we just sort of participated in that and uh, invited people in. They are real people, they're not villains. They don't think of themselves as villains or each other as villains. This is their insular world. It's just thrown way off balance by the arrival of Beatrice, Beatrice at, their, at their dinner table on a social occasion. They're just n never in their lives have they socialized with someone like that. And someone who's fearless and perfectly ready to interact with them. Uh, I think what is s almost startling about the film, what takes people by surprise is exactly that. You never people see people from one end of the economic and social spectrum interacting, let alone debating with someone at the other end. You don't see it in movies, you don't see it in real life. 
and it, it sort of creeps up on you watching the movie, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. And yet it's something that we're all, our society is infected with right now, that there's no communication between, between gigantic segments of the population like this. And I think part of the genius of the film, I mean, so much of it really is because of this man right here. Miguel is such an incredible director, and we all feel so honored to have been able to do this film with you. Um, and we'll say that for the rest Thank of our so lives much. to the ends of the earth. But, you know, all the characters in the film could easily have gone into the world of stereotype and cliche. And Miguel was just absolutely committed and determined to keep these characters as real people. And um, they're written that way for, on, from Mike White's incredible script. And so we, we really wanted to go make them more comedic and you know go over the top because the script is so funny and there's a lot of great humor in the film. But Miguel always kept the characters grounded so that they felt real and specific. And um, so, you know, when you guys watch the movie, I think you'll feel with each individual character, you're not going to be able to say, oh, that's just a bunch of rich people, a bunch of rich white people from Orange County. You're going to say, I know that guy. I know that guy. I've seen a woman just like her, and she's different from that woman. And what that what that enables you to do as an audience is it allows you to see everybody as a human being and try to understand why they think the way they do, as opposed to just pass them off as, oh, that's just a stereotype, that's just a villain, that's just a, a person who I don't agree with. Did it goes deeper than that. Well, I would say that I found, uh, as much as I dis your characters, no offense. <laughs> I found that I also kind of related to them in some capacity, whereas right. if Beatrice was at my dinner table, I probably would be as catty with my friends or have some sort of upper crust, silly inside joke that wasn't relatable and was also in some ways maybe very cynical and would need to be looked at. And as soon as someone questioned it, I would be like, oh, there's an outsider in here. And I, you know, this person doesn't necessarily belong in my world, even though theoretically and ideologically, I'm much, I'm very opposed to that kind of behavior. I completely related to these characters in and that sense. Thank you for the honesty. I was gonna say, we just, we just got a little insight White into devil, your personality. White devil right here. <laughs> Miguel, one of the things that I want to ask you about is, you, you know, you talk about how Beatrice upsets this world, and one of the things that I loved about the film, without really giving anything away, is that she doesn't upset this world. The system protects this world too much for her to really upset it. Her world becomes upset in many ways. Can you talk about sort of that? I disagree with you, but we will wait for the answer of the director <laughs> for you and I go at it. We'll go at it. We'll do that. I'm taking some aside, even though I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, uh, this is why he's so um, smart. Good, good decision, I bet. Uh, uh, you know, I, to me, uh, the film is about being an outsider. You know, it's a plea. Uh, our world is getting more divided at a time that it needs more than ever to get united. Our, our planet is a tiny little planet. This is our spaceship that we should be taking care of rather than finding reasons to hate each other. And, and, and the film, Tell, you know, I love that it's told from an immigrant's point of view because uh, uh, we feel separate all the time. We don't feel not seen. And I, I know what that feels like, and I was hoping to be able to portray that with Beatrice, what it's like. But at the same time, you know, there's, I wanted to give the surprising aspects of it, the qualities of her personality that are so good to portray what it feels like to be an immigrant. She has this intelligence in her eyes. She's hardworking. She's not afraid to tell the truth. And... Uh, um, and I think that uh, as a whole, like uh, especially the Latino community in this country, I mean, you know, some always like to point out that it's horrible that there's any stereotype of Latinos being lazy is so unnerving. We are hardworking people. And um, I love that point of view of the movie that she brings to it. Um, and uh, I'm very bad at small talk as well, just like the character. So <laughs> I, I related to it. Selma? Yes. No, I disagree. You, you said that they affect my world, but I don't affect their world, right? To a degree. I mean, when we, when we come to the final moments, it feels no, that no. they get to move on and you have the, a... No, but watch this. You see, <laughs> he, they, he attacks Beatrice. 
many, you know, many times and in a very condescending way because it's insignificant. The difference with Beatrice and the stereotype is that Beatrice is not hurt by it. Beatrice is in this dinner by accident and um, he's, she's dressed in her working clothes, which it's not the best working clothes until you see what they put, made me wear. <laughs> um, not looking at her best, she's with this very rich and powerful and uh, successful, beautiful people. Yet she, she doesn't have a complex. She doesn't feel she's inferior to them and she doesn't feel she's in awe of them. She's just uh, around, you know, and happy to be there and present. When they start being dismissive to her, she's patient and gracious and she doesn't judge them immediately out of all, because they're jerks, some of them. <laughs> and she's not like, oh, what a jerk. She's just, just present and trying to observe these people like she would observe anyone else and be patient with anyone else. And um, the upsetting is not because they upset her, they cannot touch her world, her world because she's too deep for it. She's too present and she has a lot of confidence. Not, she's not cocky about it, you know? She's not on your face about it, like real confident people are. It's when she realizes how much they're affecting the world, not her world, that she takes a different um, approach to the dinner, <laughs> takes another turn, uh, and I think everybody's going to identify by feeling the frustration and the impotence of having people that are in powerful positions that are conf they feel they are untouchable and they look down at everyone else and they actually have the power to do important decisions that affect all of us and that we cannot go up to them and say, hey, that's my life. And they're completely unconscious. And this frustration that not being able to do anything about it when you know it's absolutely wrong and they won't even take a look at it. They won't even think about how they're affecting other people's life. And so, this is a frustration that I think everyone has felt. And, uh, but Beatrice, even when it comes to that, she reacts to it in a unique way. And that's what makes the film so interesting. And f it's, it's, it's funny and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, the, my favorite direction I got from Miguel on the subject of how Beatrice affects the rest of them and how they affect her. He loved coming in and giving me, filming me, that la the last image, of course all of you have not seen the film, but he's, he said, you look at his face and you know he will never have a good night's sleep again. Oh, wow. And whether the film tells that story or not, that was the story that Miguel told me. I, it's, the, it's very typical of the wonderful way he directs. Just Thank saying you. enough to provoke your thoughts and to, to let you betray certain emotions in a very subtle way. Yeah, absolutely. It's a wonderful yeah. direction. Thank I have you. to ask, um, the character's name is Doug Strutt. Yeah. Sounds similar to Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, uh, how many did you guys have conversations about about acting like him and all? You don't act like him, end up acting like him in the film, but were there traits that you took from him at the time? Not at all. I didn't model anything on on Donald Trump. Uh, of course, it was in the air, uh, and certainly doing press for it. It's the first question everybody asks. I made it four or five I know, questions. I know. John, it's about the fourth question. Very you disciplined, but you are. It, but it's fine. <laughs> But you know, honest, it, I didn't I realized you probably had that question no, a lot, no, no, but no, like no, I said, no, don't worry about it at all. I, 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 I'm eager to talk it's about that question. aspect of it because so much, in this John. day and age, because of the election in November, you can't look at this film without having those thoughts. It's now a lightning rod film, 
In a way, the election is the best thing that ever happened to us who made Beatrice a dinner. We're about the only one. Not really. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, no, more just because the, the movie has a certain urgency and charge to it now <laughs> because it addresses things that are making half of the country, more, far more than half of the country, extremely anxious about our political moment. That said, you never approach a character simply as a cipher unless you're doing a satire or a parody. And the first conversation I ever had with Miguel over the telephone about the play and the part, uh, the screenplay and the part, was he almost talked about Doug Strutt as if he adored the guy. He, he, just so, he sort of envies the guy, a man who's completely happy with his life, completely comfortable with his power, completely unthreatened, unintimidated, not paranoid, not thick-skinned, with a charming sense of humor, a very seductive man, which makes the whole character much, much more interesting to me. Uh, he even gives him a chance to say his piece, to argue very articulately for what he really believes. Uh, when he dresses Beatrice down in the clip you just saw and says, I do what people need. I give them jobs. I give them work. I make the economy work. The script and Miguel, they give everybody a chance to sort of uh, have their moment and and define themselves. To me, that makes it much interest, more interesting than just beating the dead horse about how bad Donald Trump is. Absolutely. Connie, there, your character, there's something about her that was almost the most heartbreaking for me at times because she's almost there. She's, yeah. al she's almost there consciously with, with Beatrice and, and what it seems like these people do around her, but she's sort of unwilling to really confront it. Right, and I think that, that the character that I play, her name is Kathy, and I think that she will ultimately be very relatable to a lot of audience members because Kathy really does want, she wants to be a good person. She genuinely does, and she genuinely loves Beatrice and feels beholden to Beatrice. Um, we learn in the movie that Beatrice has actually saved her daughter's life. So um, she is, that is all extremely genuine for her, and... Um, she wants to do right by her, and so the her lim where her limitations come is that she can't see outside of her own life. She can't see outside of the comfort of her own life. Gated community. And yeah, and 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 you, I think what 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 I came away with even as a person, I, I do look outside my life quite a bit in real life, but it is not an easy thing to do, and it really. It is challenging to have to look beyond what you know to understand something other. And when you can't do that, and in my character's case, she really can't because it feels too uncomfortable and too foreign to her, then she just sees herself in Beatrice. So whenever she's nice to Beatrice, it makes her feel good about herself. So she's not really helping Beatrice, she's just helping herself. So it, getting back to your question about who impacts whose lives, I actually think Kathy's life is very impacted in the film because in the end, she will have had this, this situation that she couldn't solve and she will be left feeling this guilt that she wasn't able to just make this woman feel welcome and wonderful. And what does that mean about her? And then she'll probably push it away and go on with her life. And then also what didn't make this woman feel welcome and wonderful was everything that her life is built on. The economy that has built her life, right. the home that she lives in and how that was made are all of these things that are in many ways an affront to this. But she'll never planet. see that because you can only see that clearly when you can see other clearly. And if she can't see other clearly, then she has no awareness that this is anything that could hurt anybody. Yeah. And she'll never have that awareness. Miguel, I'm curious, John said that, you know, the, I think the film, he said it's not a satire, and I agree that it's not a satire, but the film definitely rides a line in between, uh, like a satire and a, and, and a regular comedy drama. And I think other directors would have gotten that script and immediately seen a, a piece of satire there. What was it about, what, what was it that made you see it not as that? Well, I, I think there was a lot of truth on the script. 
you know, uh, and we wanted to keep these conversations really realistic and, and keep it keep it truthful. Mike White said, actually, you know, I've been in rooms where people say more outrageous and things that will be funnier, but I think we have to tone them down because no one will believe them. So uh, uh, we wanted to keep it on the believable side of it because uh, ultimately we're trying to tell an uh, entertaining story in a tense environment. And you know, the brilliance of his idea is to have a large discussion in a very casual, relatable place like a dinner party. And uh, but ultimately we wanted to try and get the audience to think a little bit about, you know, these larger frustrations that we're living. You know, um, the movie really is a plea for compassion. And uh, I, I love hearing that it's tense and it makes you laugh because there's nothing worse you know, like Lou Reed said, that great saying, give me an issue, I'll give you a tissue. <laughs> uh, 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 and like, I hate those kind of movies. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but we wanted to be realistic and have truth to it so that when we get to the ending, to the part where we are asking you to think with us or at least contemplate, you know, our feelings about how we're taking this world in, in a very bad direction that, uh, that you would believe it. How long was the yeah. shoot, if I may ask? Oh, sorry. Can I just say one yes, thing? Please. I'm sorry to interrupt, but as a Latina, because I have to say this as a Latina, I'm so proud of Miguel, who is also a Latin director. And I love that in the film, he does something so, so special that I, that I think only somebody who's Puerto Rico, whose heart was uh, beating to the rhythm of... Puerto Rico could do so brilliantly, which was the, he does a, a seamless combination of uh, hyper-realism and magical realism, which is a, a very Latin way of seeing life, you know? Gabriel Garcia Marquez, I think, shows it beautiful in his work, how we live in this magical realism. And so I think when you, we think it's a satire, it's a... Is it too real? Is it not? I think the the very unique style that he brings is that when we are in the magical realism, you don't feel like you went so far away. And then in the hyper realism, um, it almost feels like it's a. It could feel sometimes as it's a little bit big. But not because it's big at all. It's super real, because li because it's life observed from a big point of view and making it very simple. In other words, all the the scenes are very subtle, but the reaction that the audience have it's very strong. And I think this is something that it's so beautiful that. It, and it's part of his very unique style. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a right here? Hey, guys. Um, so I was just wondering, like, from a political standpoint, like, how important do you think this film would be to um, audiences? Well, uh, very. How, how important <laughs> will, will it be? You're going to change the world, bro. So. Mo movies, <laughs> it, it's very hard to define how important movies are. I mean, great, thrilling stories are important to people because they... They give them emotional exercise. They sort of uh, heighten their responses, whether it's a comedy, a drama, or a horror film. Uh, if it's a really good film, it's important. We all rely on stories. I think what's important about this is, I think that quote is a really good one. It's the first great film of the Trump era. It's a film that really addresses what's happening right now. Uncannily, we made the film before before this enormous political sea change, but it addresses this sea change. And you, as I said before, you can't look at this film without thinking about what you've been thinking about all day today. It's just, what do we all do in the morning? We check the absurd and horrifying latest events in the news. Well, this is a film that grapples with those, and yet it does it purely by putting a lot of interesting people together and in conflict with each other and in communication with each other. To me, that makes an important, that's an important moment. Yeah. And also I want to add, you know, that's a, you ask, is it politically important? I think the, the greatest importance of the film goes beyond politics because I think the, the film 
questions your loyalty and courage towards your own humanity. And, and this is a, I find this extremely important today. And it tries to create breaches where we see at the end of the day, we're not all that different. I think in very different styles, we are looking for the same thing, these two characters. Unconsciously, maybe him more than me. <laughs> We're looking for something that's missing. We have a thirst for something that's missing. And at some point he says something that, that makes them together. Purity. We are looking to go back to that place where we can be pure. Unfortunately, he thinks he's gonna get it through hunting. <laughs> <laughs> and money. <laughs> you know, but the, the, the important thing is that, and this is what can give us hope, even though we see all the things that are happening, is that at the core, all human beings, consciously or unconsciously, I think we have a yearning to go back to that place of innocence and purity. So I think it's important. There's a beautiful, one of the most beautiful scenes in the film, as you will see when you see it, <laughs> is a film involving a song sung in Spanish about las cosas simples, simple things. <laughs> and uh, uh, Salma sings it beautifully to six people who don't understand a word of it. <laughs> and yet but, it but, uh, somehow or other deeply affects them. Uh, it's, it's quite a magic, we talk about magic. I'm gonna impress all the Latinos for a second with John. John, can you please say Tlatlecutle? Tlatlecutle. Yes! <laughs> Very good. Connie, did you wanna add something? Oh, I was just gonna say in regard to uh, the importance of the film, uh, you know, something to me that is always uh, shows shows how a film is important is when it reflects our, when our stories reflect us back to ourselves and I do believe that because of the way the story is told because of the way these characters are painted audiences will walk away and be able to have conversation with each other because they are seeing parts of themselves that they recognize parts of other people that they recognize, they'll have more insight into that and it might give them a, a passageway or a bridge to, to have the conversations about what's happening in the world right now that maybe they wouldn't have had before. And so I think that's something that I'm hoping will be impactful for, for audiences. I had a very unusual experience a couple of weeks ago. I interviewed the Harvard's president, Drew Faust, and she told about something she had created with, at Harvard University, a big, uh, you, 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 you know, the, uh, uh, a university with a great sense of its own importance. She had created a task force on in, inclusion and belonging, as she called it, which was a sort of diversity task force. But her way of approaching it was to take people, to find people, to invite people from every single stratum of the great big Harvard community, from deans of the medical school to janitors who work, uh, who clean the buildings at night, bring them together and have them tell stories of moments when they have felt they were not included. And the, story she the stories she told were so incredibly moving. It made me think of our film. Our film is all about people telling stories to each other, getting to know each other, and trying to golf these enormous, uh, uh, close these enormous gulfs that, that separate us. I think we have time for one more question. Hello, thank you for being here today. I love and admire all of you. My question to you is, what do you hope that we get out of when we watch this film? What do we walk away with? Like, what do you want us to see? That's your responsibility. <laughs> And we don't dare to take it away from you. Compassion, well. though. <laughs> passion, But that yeah. being said, I hope you have some compassion. <laughs> Guys, uh, I love the film so much. Congratulations. It's wonderful work. Uh, how can people see it? When can people see Beatrice at dinner? 
This Friday. Yeah, the, this Friday in New York and LA, and then on That's the 16th it. of June uh, in many more cities. Congratulations. Thank you so much for being Great. here. Thank Thank you. Please go see. Thank you for yes.